my name is Prathamesh uh, Prabhu Desai, a uh, medical doctor, uh, graduate from Georgia Tech, uh, currently a venture partner at F50. Uh, predominantly, uh, I'm focused more towards healthcare and biomedical engineering, medical devices. Uh, KJ is sick today, so I'll be moderating the panel instead of him. So I hope you all are excited to learn more from the luminaries about AI and investing. So l let me introduce the panelists. Uh, first panelist is John D Dorico. Uh, John is a deeply experienced and trusted leader in the global semiconductor industry. His rich experience has been highlighted by a commitment to delivering long-lasting competitive advantage, building bridges, and realizing great results. His achievements include driving the largest single order, valued at $500 million at Applied Materials, driving the largest operational lease in Taiwan, at the time valued at $220 million, and receiving the DUV Lithography Challenge Award from Intel. Right. Please welcome John. Next panelist is Howard Chow. Howard is a Howard is a partner at Acon Pacific Ventures. He's passionate and experienced in early stage technology. He co-invented a robotic self-driving motorcycle that resides on display at the Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington DC. He has represented Econ Investments in both Shanghai and Silicon Valley. Please welcome Howard. The third panelist is Sanjeet Dang. He is a very successful venture capitalist, corporate executive, board member, and a writer. He currently co-founded uh, UFirst Capital and is the chairman there. Uh, previously, he was with Intel. Uh, Intel Capital, and they had successful exits almost every year for five consecutive years. Uh, at UFirst Capital, uh, they connect corporates with startups and universities for, uh, as their venture strategic interests. Please g give a round of applause for all the panelists. So can each one of you in brief Share your story on how and when in your careers you got actively involved in investment and artificial in intelligence. You know, um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. Um, uh, investing in AI kind of crept in, honestly speaking. And uh, to a great extent, AI is just a buzzword by itself. The reality is that if you go back in town, back in time, 15, 20 years ago, when nobody used to talk about AI in the corporate world, we used to just talk about data and analytics. Statistical data analysis, for example. And that fueled a lot of startups, after especially AWS became the catalyst. And there, were, there was a whole wave of big data analytics based startups that came up. Some of them became really big uh, companies, uh, some went south, but and then came the AI buzzword. And overnight, the startup founders did a cut and replace in their pitch deck, replace big data with AI and change the domain name uh, of their website from .com to .ai, <laughs> just to look good. So, uh, so you know, talking about investing in AI, uh, we all have been doing that for at least 15 years. So I don't think it's a new field. Now, there are some elements of AI, deep learning being an example, that is ushering in a whole new era, and we can talk in more detail on that. But AI in general has been there in the investment world for a very long time. And I was at Intel Capital till last year, just uh, uh, to give a quick round of introduction here, ring, uh, quick introduction here. And at Intel Capital, we did a bunch of investments in data and uh, AI, and I continue to do that in uh, my new fund, UFirst Capital. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I, w- I would certainly have to agree with Sanjeet. Although my 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 time investing is probably not as long as him. It it's more like the um, the rest of the marketplace all of a sudden started saying AI overnight. Um, it, to be to be quite frank, even. 15 uh, years ago when I was building robots, um, you know, we never used the word AI and, and a lot of those techniques that are still, that I used to use back then that are, that are still being used now all of a sudden are, are being called AI. Uh, I would say I started to work in it. Uh, investment has been more recently, but uh, hearkening back to what Sanjeet said about data collection, I recall back in the 1990s, I was working in advanced lith- lithography introducing DPV scanning to Intel, as a matter of fact. I also worked at another, so that was with Silicon Valley Group, another company called KLA 10 Core. And we, we kind of started it in the lithography world because that was always where the highest leverage was on the exposure across the wafer and the CD controls and all these kind of things. But as, as we got to KLA 10 Core, I was uh, the director of one of the divisions um, which was the CD SEM division, E Beam. We had film thickness, we had overlay, and we ended up putting together a string of these tools and inserting them into the customer process line to do real time what we call feed forward and feed back. And by doing so, you could optimize each wafer basically. And we developed this pretty successfully working with a couple customers. At the time, we had this tool set which approximately we say would cost about 15 or 20 million dollars for a set of tools but by doing so you could actually w- increase your bin sort output you know the bin you know as you sort uh, the chips coming up the line to a higher performance level and you could uh, increase the yield obviously and then you could also what we said put 20 million dollars into this tool set and you buy yourself an extra technology generate one half of a technology generation in extra um, horsepower. So if you were at 0.35, you kind of got half the way to 0.25, let's say. So um, this small investment would give you a huge leverage in that regard. And then it became, I think, industry standard to just kind of continuously chase the shrinks and the improvements and it really proliferated and people got into chamber fingerprinting, um, gas species and all these other kind of emissions and so on and so forth. Um, More recently, I've actually had a pretty uh, exciting investment, a company called Z Tractor and Z Tractor happened to meet them, became an advisor, um, brought together all the angel investors, since then went and got a pension fund investor but we, we we took the initial angel money, and for about $200,000, we wrote software that's about 85% complete. We built the prototype. We have it operating in some of the best world-class wineries in the world and other places um, doing what is the autonomous electric farming, um, which is a very compelling model. Um, in this, And we are already are talking to, for example, a major public company who's a John Deere distributor that is looking at ordering hundreds of millions of dollars of these uh, tractors. <laughs> anyway, we're just out of a prototype. <coughs> but the market is extremely big, and <coughs> the data collection, as well as the self-navigation, um, is something that solves everything from emissions um, to labor problems. And then there's the, the yield and productivity on the farm. Um, and so I'm pretty optimistic we'll all be seeing organic food at cheaper prices than you know, uh, normal pesticide laden and other kinds of food and we can solve it and we can improve yields and we can solve a lot of global problems in the, in the um, process. So long story, sorry for the long answer. Yeah, like, like, like you pointed out, that was exactly going to be my next question about the buzzword. So w- w- when you're looking at a lot of pitch decks, almost each of them has AI written on it. So how do you, where do you demarcate between data analysis and general purpose intelligence where wh- who has the skill set when you're evaluating a team and maybe like building algorithms which could maybe result in... Vi- computer vision or natural language processing. So where exactly do you draw that line? Um, You are right that a lot of pitch decks do look very similar nowadays. Um, One of the things I have done for a number of years is uh, I let the uh, entrepreneurs uh, do the presentation uh, first 10-15 minutes 
and then if I find something interesting, I say let's shut down the projector and let's do a whiteboard session because I'm less interested in a pre, you know, um, prepared presentation. I'm more interested in what is in their mind rather than a marketing pitch to investors. Um, and at that time, and I'm also, I, I can claim to know a lot about AI, but uh, I, I am not uh, an AI expert either. But uh, I get, try to get to the next level of expertise that they have within AI. And how that technology ties into the problem they are solving using AI. AI is a tool at the end of the day. And I am typically trying to understand whether the entrepreneurs can articulate clearly what they are trying to achieve. Because if they cannot articulate clearly to me, then how will they articulate clearly to their next employee, to their customer, partner, etc. So it's you can look at AI, but you also have to look at it a little more holistically. And then within AI diligence, you can look at the team and their strength and their background in AI and data, what they have done. And I personally speaking, am more a fan of verticalized solutions using AI. One solution for healthcare, one for fintech, one for retail, etc. cetera. Um, there are always exceptions and I do acknowledge that, but in most cases, I don't believe you can build a fully horizontal company mm -hmm. that can go across five sectors mm -hmm. using AI. Mm -hmm. Because the flavor of data changes from sector to sector. The type of data changes. So it's not one engine that you can build. So those are some of the elements that I look at when I'm evaluating AI companies. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, and for the moderator, that's a very interesting question. I I, I think it's 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 uh, it's uh, from personal um, experience and as well as a lot of the other investors I I, I work with, uh, it's fair to ignore the term AI right now. It's almost as synonymous as just saying software. Um, you guys may have felt the same about IoT. Well, what is IoT? Might as well just say the internet. Uh, so in that context, you know, I'm all with Sanjit here, it, it's really important what the application is. And I think the bare minimum expectation nowadays, at least when you are working with technologists or investors, that when AI is referred to, that it is some form of a modern neural net. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think the point is to get the closest connection to the application, to the customer, and then be able to use this effectively. There, there are certainly all the models to just sell data, but depending on how you define your company and your core business, you want to be the one figuring out your customer and how they tick the very best way you can um, and the application that they're trying to do. Um, Henry Ford said, if I asked people what they wanted, they'd say, you know, faster horses, basically. And so that, that's kind of um, part of the thing is you, you don't want to get so deep into <laughs> what is the old paradigm or a certain way of doing things where it limits you from seeing a new vision and new innovation. So hopefully what it does is gets you closer to the customer, you understand problems, you understand opportunities, and you combine that with new technology, innovation, new ideas, and so you can uh, have a sustainable leadership. I think that's really what is the application of AI and what everybody should uh, be shooting for rather than just saying we have an AI enabled blah, 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 and this and that, and it's uh, just using the catch, catch words in that case. Yeah, so like you pointed out, uh, wh when do you think uh, AI, the term AI would be replaced by conventional software? Just like there are these buzzwords, <laughs> when do you I, think I, I, I this love will, on buzzword that. So, will fade? So cer certainly one thing that I've noticed, and I, I think a lot of people in this room would agree, is uh, uh, the word blockchain is is no longer really being used. And it's it's almost now synonymous with just, say, database, in at least in the context <laughs> that they're being used in product development. Um, 
I, I don't see AI going away as quickly as the term blockchain, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, I, d there are, I, d at least what I personally feel, some really amazing things that are going to uh, happen in the next few years that uh, people will credit kind of these modern techniques that have really emerged in the last 10 years uh, to being able to achieve. And, and, and that's um, um, probably going to bring in a lot more f fame than, than what, what, uh, what Bitcoins have, at least. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I, I, J John sent you. Um. Yeah. I. I don't think AI will go away as a buzzword anytime soon. It's probably here to stay for a number of years, till we create something new, uh, <laughs> maybe space-based something or whatever. It. But it's funny, you know. If, uh, you talk about eighty-five. Um, back when I was in grad school, there was an AI lab. And no student wanted to do his master's or PhD there because there were no AI jobs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so everybody told me, no, 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 don't go. That's, that's a wrong field. There will never be jobs in AI. So, you know. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, intelligence is an intelligence, artificial or real, or uh, how we define that is uh, probably the question. Um, part of the question is also, do we have something to fear from what is uh, called AI? And I think there's a lot of hype around that. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with um, human mastery of certain things. And rather than call it being manual-based and iterative-based, you actually are thinking-based. Um, which brings to mind what I think is uh, more important, which is wisdom. Wisdom is actually passing judgment and making determinations based on insight, based on experience, based on a value system. And I think that's really where, um, you know, you can have the most intelligence in the world, but, um, you know, this debate over who, who's going to go faster? You know, there's uh, Kai Fu Lee says China's going to win because the government's going to pour in money and they're going to go faster. And that's the decision, even though we have 68 of the best AI guys here and they have 32, eventually it's going to flip. One of the questions is, though, do you want to go faster on self-driving cars on a rainy day? And, the, you know, it's not perfected. And the, the answer is no. We, there is a high-speed train that crashed between Shanghai and Beijing at one time. The U.S. probably has also stubbed our toes or had those incidents as well. So sometimes it's the wisdom and the intelligence um, and the understanding of, um, call it a reasonable process, um, and going through what I would call the human evolution, and it's, it's sociological, and there are a lot of people, I have a nephew who's over at UC Berkeley in advanced physics, but people um, right now oftentimes, they want to hire the technical person with some other, call it social or liberal arts skill set that adds the wisdom <laughs> to what is the intelligence, right? Um, so I think this debate will obviously rage on. No, to, to the point you brought up yesterday, uh, br brought up just yesterday a wrongful death lawsuit was filed against Tesla alleging that the autopilot system caused a crash and death. Mm. Uh, so my question is as both private markets and governments keep financing AI based companies there is a lot of vested interest. So how, how do you see this impacting the ethical and regulatory landscape? Yeah it really does come down to you know, risk management, I think, and um, kind of have a fully developed uh, testing um, and, uh, you know, uh, use cases and all those kind of things. And unfortunately, the things, you can use data collection and machine learning and all those things, and those will get you, you know, the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 or something, but there are those Six Sigma events that cause stock markets to crash and global recessions or depressions to happen that um, nobody could ever predict were going to happen at all. Uh, I mean, no model would predict those things, and they're way out of, you know, millions of years of likelihood of happening, but they do happen. And so I think um, those are the kind of things where we need a higher level of intelligence, as they say, to solve the problems that we created in a lower level of intelligence. So we have to rise up above it to solve these kind of problems. And that's not an easy question because people do die. But hopefully as we're doing this, we're um, becoming safer and we're understanding it better and we're having smoother introductions and societal change adaptations and so on. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Sanjay go first. I don't think I have too much of a comment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, I, I, 
I don't know if there is more to add to what he said, but I think uh, it's time to start looking ahead and looking at uh, what AI can do ethically and uh, <coughs> so we can get into Facebook example, etc, etc. But uh, I think the boundaries of boundaries of ethics are also being redefined, honestly speaking. So, how and where you place the line is also being questioned to a great extent. And it's AI, it's an AI question, but before that it's actually a data question. And where do you leverage the data, who owns the data, what can you do with the data in a rightful way. I actually think AI can be used to solve some of the big world problems. Um, like poverty, like human trafficking. Uh, there are signs, there are some data analytics you can do to catch these things. Uh, uh, but those are the things that we have to leverage AI for. But there has to be a whole uh, focused effort by either an organization or government uh, to drive that. That is not happening. That's actually my frustration with the AI world. And I'm also myself to blame for not doing it. But I think there is a potential to leverage AI to solve those kinds of big problems. Sure, sure. I'm I making sure. Sure. I mean, these are these are conversations that I've that I've that I've heard around. Them, you know, speaking to how can government regulate safety or claims based on uh, some automated system, perhaps a score. People people have talked talked about that. Um, but then you can start talking about you know how reliable your system is, how accurate it is, if it's uh, doing something that can even be measured, and then uh, maybe potentially re re reporting that to some authority. Uh, maybe some authority that that would then underwrite or ensure kind of stuff that could potentially go wrong. Uh, those conversations certainly have heard arise. Uh, you, you know, people talk about these, uh, but then it, it kind of destroys the whole voodoo of AI. Then, therefore, if 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 you open that black box or you kind of show your cards to your competitors as well, and and right now we really are, I, I would say, in 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 the midst of a very large gold rush right now for people chasing. Um, all of those gaps that can be closed by this kind of automation, and I, I, you know, I can't imagine that until the technology space itself, the tools that people are using, s stabilize and become standard until some type of, you can say, measurement or quality kind of rating can can be applied. So, uh, next question is on corporate ventures. Sanjeev is an expert. So more and more corporate ventures are interested in investing in AI startups, mostly to get a strategic advantage. How do you see this trend impacting the rest of the startup ecosystem in the coming years? Um, so it is very true that uh, corporates are, number one, creating venture capital funds. And number two, they are investing uh, in AI, among other areas as well. Um, I like I mentioned I used to be at Intel Capital and we did a pretty heavy we did a lot of investments in AI and then uh, at U First Capital we created U First Capital with that thesis of becoming the outsourced venture capital fund for corporations because we see the trend but corporations don't know how to manage venture capital they don't have the DNA and it's hard for them to hire the right team who has the right experience, network, etc. So there is a gap in the market. Uh, we created a fund with Dow DuPont to invest in IoT and AI. That fund, the goal of the fund is to invest in growth areas for Dow DuPont. Stuff that is beyond their current core and so on and we see that trend across the corporations that are working with us or, or even the others that are talking to us. So I think uh, there is a growing need and there is a growing realization in the corporate world that if I don't embrace AI, I will get disrupted. In fact, I feel that in 10 years, the Fortune 100 companies, uh, most of them will change. The names 
that you will see in 10 years will be very different from the ones that are currently on that list. And the ones don't, that do not embrace AI will probably get disrupted. So, there, there is definitely a trend and hence an opportunity and that is why it, uh, we are focused on that. Um, speaking from the perspective of someone who has never worked in a large corporation, um, I, I think it's I think it's it's absolutely critical as well for these um, large organizations to really embrace the how to unlock the value of their data. They're sitting on lots of data. They're sitting on uh, I can imagine decades long um, sources of data. Uh, where whereas you know you look at some of the emerging talent that is developing automation, uh, th these guys don't have access to that data. That's a really critical piece in actually building a solution that's effective and reliable. Um, you know, on, on, on one hand, I, 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 y you do hear a lot of horror stories about really bad partnerships between corporate um, strategic investors and startup companies. Uh, you know, very quickly those relationships can sour into, well, um, a good startup team becoming uh, uh, the most effective but lowest paid kind of engineering team of a larger enterprise. <laughs> It can easily kind of morph into that that setting, but I think when the right relationships are there uh, with the right corporate and the right team uh, that can unlock that value of that corp corporation's data, I think it, that's an excellent excellent uh, combination. Yeah, I, I haven't been a corporate VC. I've been a beneficiary of investment, um, but I think some of the um, core things that uh, they need to, that they're trying to address is. Um, call it ingrained thinking within a corporation which causes limitations in what they're able to do. For example, Cisco having to create a separate company to do software-defined networking, or Bill Gates saying the Internet's a fad, right? And so, I mean, right from the top. Or Elon Musk when he, he said the best day of my life was when BMW announced they will not build a 5 Series electric car. And so it, it's less sometimes about actually g having data, it's more about the dominance of what I would call the old culture or the ingrained culture or people who have a vested interest in not letting the new guy become successful because it's going to be a loss of power for them. So I think um, having that mechanism to stimulate AI and to stimulate new businesses that can engage in different ways um, and support people with new ideas and new styles, I think that's the real goal there and hopefully it'll continue to grow. So all three of you mentioned that uh, AI can be used to solve global problems. But just from a financial perspective, what do you think is the most lucrative sector where you can <laughs> get maximum return on investment by investing in AI? Yeah, yeah, good. Anybody uh, want did. to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think uh, there are two sectors uh, where AI can really make an impact. Keep in mind AI needs data. So, number one is the whole retail slash commerce sector mm -hmm. and there is a lot of data available, um, point of sale data in stores, online commerce data, social media data, people post, oh, I like Coke. So, you know people like, oh, you can go after them. If you are Pepsi, you can go after them, right? So, there is a lot of data fueled. Uh, innovation you can drive uh, in that sector, retail or commerce sector. That's one. Second is a sector where I haven't seen too much impact from AI, but I think there is a lot of scope is manufacturing. Um, there are massive manufacturing uh, companies, Foxconn, etc., are great examples. And they're churning out their machines are running 24 by 7, churning out data, but uh, we still don't have that level of uh, automation in manufacturing as yet. And I think there is there is a lot of scope to improve productivity. We all talk about Industry 4.0, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a great buzzword term, but you need the underlying technologies to bring that to reality. And I think the if you look at, at a global level, you start driving that level of automation that AI can bring to manufacturing, you will drive massive cost reductions. 
hence you will drive more a whole new level of consumption of goods at a global level and that will drive gdp growth that will up level the mid tier of the society to higher tier i mean the impact is massive potential impact is massive uh, if you can really bring whole new efficiencies into uh, manufacturing uh, to some extent my this this it's not my thought it's actually a branch of from what jeff bezos talks about for amazon he says people ask me what are the next three things you are working on and he says my answers are we work on things like cost reduction it doesn't sound like attractive to say that but that's what we work on mm -hmm. or we work on one hour delivery right but you know saying that hey i want to drive cost reduction for amazon it's actually not easy uh, so they have a whole supply chain network warehouse delivery everything now you have to figure out how do i drive cost and to do that you have to bring automation you have to bring yeah but i think you can take that thought and apply it to global manufacturing companies and go almost 10x in productivity mm -hmm. uh, that's like a, that's that's going to have an impact at a mankind level uh, I, I, I think Sanjit and I are talking about the same thing. He's just coming from a different direction. Um, and, and, and what I'm going to say is, is transportation and logistics, that that is an area that I'm uh, very interested in. And precisely for a lot of the same um, reasons on the side, uh, changes in retail, uh, changes in supply chains, ch uh, improvements in manufacturing as well. And transportation logistics itself is generally a space where participants are not that efficient with each other in interacting with each other, and as well as uh, you're, you're looking at a um, a industry where um, you can generally describe as most participants are not making that much money, very very slim margins. Uh, but the market itself is is gigantic if you look at it globally. Uh, I'm going to give a libertarian answer. Um, government is the biggest consumer of wealth. Um, the average person, it has been said, is carrying, you think about the 1950s and 60s, and you had one person working, and they have a happy, comfortable lifestyle. They work 8 to 5 or 9 to 6 or something, and everything's fine. So quality of life is great. Today, we are taxed so heavily at every point in our life that we turn, um, and AI is being used to help the government to do that um, and to track you and to think of new ways to implement, such as California's attempt to tax text messages and things like this. So if, if we really, it, they were rejected by the FCC, luckily, saying it's not your turf, and I'm glad, it's one time when I'm glad that Washington interfered in states' rights, but, um, you know, I, I think that has got to be the biggest negative trend in our lifetimes coming from New Hampshire where I grew up where there was no income tax and no sales tax and the schools had the lowest expenditure per pupil in the nation and yet the highest scores consistently. Um, I know by experience that um, there is a better way for all of us to keep privacy, um, freedom and wealth and thrive. And so it, it would be that and it would also have to be the gl uh, global trend towards extreme financialization. And so applying AI to that trend to somehow be on the right side of it as opposed to the wrong side of uh, becoming a debt f uh, feudal um, servant, I think um, would be what I think is uh, where I would look. I, I think those are the big opportunities. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not running for office. So. <laughs> the question was about making money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're great. Reducing cost is making money, right? It's a, my dad, he grew up in the Depression. He said, if you can save a dollar, you can make it, you know, you make a dollar. So, so if you look at it, the way uh, investment is being driven into AI and the space at which there is change, it is drastically different from the pace at which other sectors are moving. And when AI gets involved into other sectors, there's going to be a clash of Spaces. So, how how do you see this impacting like humans socially, like from a workforce standpoint? I, I think the skill set has got to stay ahead of the AI capability, and unfortunately, 
there are people that are always dislocated um, as technology and society changes. And so, um, you know, I, I just acquired a factory yesterday um, in the Northwest, and there are workforce retraining funds available that we're going to use to help improve the skills of people who are affected and make them, actually, we're, we're offering higher salaries, but we're asking them to wear multiple hats and use fewer people. And I think that's, you know, you, you've got to um, work towards understanding the trends and not being a victim, right? I mean, that, I think that's a real key. And I think AI, hopefully, um, with additional wisdom can help us to have foresight and rather than solving, you know, fighting the battle from the last war, we see the future and we kind of uh, prevent what are those uh, uh, terribly dislocating events for people. Um, Definitely. I used to appear the BI, you know, the BI one time. Yeah, business intelligence. Business intelligence, yeah. you know, so next so, to CI. So, so what happened within the corporate world, uh, BI and AI? You know, why uh, two different segments using it? Or uh, I'd be want to comment. I go ahead. Uh, I, you know, again, just coming from my opinion, I do generally just only think of AI when it's mentioned to me as kind of modern techniques of of neural networks. So I, I think. I see it more as a technique or, or a tool that can be applied in a variety of manners. Yeah, AI can fuel BI, honestly speaking. BI is more into dashboarding and reporting. Um, so AI can be the underlying technology for that. But I agree, BI as a buzzword has kind of faded out. Yeah, people don't talk about it. We have seen so many BI companies come out and become big, but uh, nobody uses that term anymore. Uh, AI has, uh, yeah, we can talk about all that uh, day, uh, all, the, all day long about that. AI needs a business model still. They, they need BI too, they don't have that. It's out of control, it is, it, the buzzword is out of control. I, I think AI is probably part of the same repetitive cycle we've always had, which you can go to various other things like the railroad investment boom and bust. And they, they were over invested, everyone went bankrupt, but it was a real beneficial business and eventually came back and same is true with the internet and so on and so forth. So I, I would say AI has got to be similar in many regards or in exactly the same regard. Um, I think the business intelligence hopefully can be used um, Reporting things and understanding them after you've been affected is not as good as having real-time perception. And so that I, I think that's what we're trying to get to, be it with self-driving cars, where in the real time you can see things, you can assess them, you can act upon them in the right way. Um, and that's really what I think everyone's trying to get to with BI as well, um, to do the right things in advance. Th there were other questions in the audience. How about the medical field? AI point of view, what's your perception of that? Anybody? No, we, we uh, heard like my presentation today or something. Uh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. So, 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 so with, with, with medical imaging, that's already being transformed. Uh, a, a lot of tools to assist radiologists on how to uh, be able to better identify uh, phenomena that's going on in, in, in whatever kind of imaging uh, uh, scan that that they're working with um i wouldn't i don't believe any any radiologists are being uh completely replaced quite yet uh <laughs> so that's that's good that's good um uh, and pro probably something that was more of a, a topic about um five six years ago and and now there are companies are uh, th there are uh tools that assist surgeons in surgery uh some of these tools are completely robotic and some tools uh, just really kind of augment the surgeon's uh, motions, uh, their motions of their hands, and to make sure that n nothing erratic or out of uh, any slip ups uh, uh, take place. Yeah, I, I can add something to that. So I'm a medical doctor by training and did some okay. data science. So <laughs> You're the expert. Yeah, so uh, fr frankly speaking, in medicine, there are a lot more problems in terms of like acquiring data. I, I think medicine would see a boom of AI maybe like in the, uh, after five years because still you're not able to 
take your radiology report from one center to the other because there's so much issue with interoperability. You still have to like repeat a scan and there are a lot of messed up administrative processes, I think, which AI could potentially help. It could streamline physician workflow. Like there are a few startups which are maybe like automated documentation of wh whatever physician patient interaction happened. Like th there are, there's something called a startup called Suki which was adopted at a few centers in the Bay Area. So that, that's one sector. Then there are other startups like Leantas or Qventus who try to optimize physician scheduling and scheduling of surgical rooms. So th these are like workflow-based healthcare uh, systems are initially going to be targeted by AI, I feel. And r radiology is going to be something which would be secondary. And a lot of physicians say this, that Physicians who will use AI for their benefit will replace the physicians who do not use AI, like just like Sanjeev pointed out earlier. Yeah, and I, I would say uh, seeing Nikolai there, I think uh, he's probably dying to uh, talk about, for example, DNA and genetics, um, things also such as uh, all the false positives or false negatives that happen when people are looking at cancer and sometimes if someone's told you have cancer, you will die and they go around in a horrible status for a while and then finally they're gonna live, which is great. But likewise, if you're told you're fine and you really are not, uh, that's a big problem. A lot of this, I think, as we're talking about, is all about data collection. Um, I would also say that can we use AI to do other types of sampling, for example, non-ionizing metrology and inspection, and you know, instead of radiology, use maybe terahertz or um, ultrasound or whatever you have, and can you use it in a way in combination with AI where you can get an equal or better result? Uh, so that's what I would try to, you know, always, you know, the first rule of Socrates, do no harm first in medicine, and so I would try to minimize um, even things in the hospital where there's some uh, really bad disease vectors that are spreading around, and so can you <laughs> have mind monitor, sensing, and um, preventive measures in those regards. Yeah, it, it can definitely add on to like the physician's capability. When a physician observes symptoms, they just see macro level changes. But if you have instruments to detect micro level changes and maybe like get a graph and classify on like, hey, this is something which happened way before a physician could detect it by examining you physically. So that is like another space. So you're talking about that you are interested in the uh, transportation and the logistics. We have the company thinking about the last mile delivery intelligence. So can you talk more about why that is? Sure. Sure, sure. So, uh, so I have I have made an investment in at least one uh, logistics company. Um, there, there are. Um, there, especially this company does make software for the last mile. Why it's really interesting to me is is um, the reality fact is, is delivery drivers are not paid very much money uh, per delivery. Uh, it's a really difficult job. There are a lot of things that decisions that need to be made in real time, and um, at least right now in the existing industry here in the United States. Now, now I know other countries are doing much better in terms of using technology than, than the U.S. is for, for deliveries, precisely. Uh, they, there are so many opportunities to have uh, some piece of software to automate rerouting, rescheduling, even things such as basic as um, if a driver is unable to complete a delivery, uh, is it, can information be passed up stream through his organization to resolve that issue in real time. And that really is just, just information flowing within, within, within the organization. Uh, and that, that can expand into amazing, uh, uh, again, back to real time, kind of what John was mentioning is, it is you, you're really harnessing the data that's, that, that your enterprise is, is creating at that time, and then automating a lot of the recommendations or decision making on figuring out what's the next best option, uh, uh, best actions to take. Um, and that could unlock amazing things. You were talking about last mile. I mean, you could go from uh, one delivery modality, like from a van to a, to a person, back to 
another person, if there's a change made in real time to get uh, assets within your network to begin starting intersecting with each other. And this is, this is to actually have that in real time really goes way beyond what a room uh, uh, of dispatchers are, are able to actually um, do. Yeah, so do you know like uh, I, there is like, uh, according to the research, the last mm -hmm. five years, the total delivery is 50% off the market. Okay, uh, maybe from a cost perspective, I believe that yeah. that's probably yeah. yeah. From the cost perspective, mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. so we were uh, we were trying to put the infrastructure in national wide as a, as a smart worker and as a hub and uh, how we solve the yeah yeah. yeah. I, I think that's great. Yeah, those those are a lot of the things that I imagine, and I it, it is automation to some extent. I wouldn't necessarily say. Uh, AI, as in neural nets, are the best approach to this right now. A lot of it is really simple stuff like uh, let's let's put like a locker, right, that can be unlocked from a signal from the internet, right, and then let's get that in there first. Yeah. So we try to building the network, not just the, you know, uh, the, you know, infrastructure. We really mm -hmm. logic like the software mm -hmm. with the rest of the business of Amazon. Mm -hmm. and then we try to build that infrastructure. And the last mile delivery, if people want, they can get in from the hour and a half to the end point. Of yeah. To some, like, chill, like, yeah. Yeah, great. And, and I can imagine as other um, related technologies, now I'm getting back into the AI space, robots start getting more reliable or more importantly, cheaper. Uh, again, people don't pay, don't want to pay anything for a delivery, to, to, to be honest. Uh, so so as, as those catch up, you know, the, then you are working now with a delivery network, which is more like a, uh, a, a software solution where really uh, nodes within your network are interchangeable with um, you know, whatever assets are available to you. Yeah, yeah so uh, how much time do we have? Oh, we don't have time, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so he, he, he's already angry. Thank you so much. Uh, pl please give a round of applause for our panelists. And thanks for being here today. Thank you for the great moderation.